Well, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our first Com Lab. Um, we're just trying this out. It's a bit of a pilot. We're uh, definitely hoping to get some feedback and um, Mark and I will be working together on this presentation. Um, and actually, this is uh, sort of the topic for today. It'll be a, a focus on presentations. Um, this will be uh, the outline for today. And uh, I definitely wanted to give a special shout out to Rob Pettigrew at the University Library who gave us some notes to work with, um, and a bit of his time and, and definitely helped um, us get a, a good outline for our presentation. Um, so let's just set the stage here. There are 500 million PowerPoint users in the world right now. Each day they give 30 million presentations. At this moment, there are about a million presentations going on. And 50% of them are definitely unbearable. Lots of people are boring each other with really bad presentations right now. And bad presentations equal bad communication. It's definitely uh, a vicious cycle. But what is the problem? You know, some uh, users tend to use their deck as a teleprompter, reading everything on the slide word for word. Uh, they pack the slide with so much information that it's hard to know what to focus on. Uh, confusing charts are added without context with text that's too small for anyone to read. And we know we can definitely do better. So what is the ideal presentation? It's clear, concise, and catchy. But before we build a presentation, it's important to ask ourselves why we're presenting. What is our goal? Is it just to pass the information on? Is it because your supervisor told you to, or is it to make meaning? Once you've decided on your goal, once you've decided on your goal, it's important to think about how that information should be presented. It will also help you with all, other, all the other steps involved in creating an effective and engaging presentation. With your presentation goal in mind, create an outline for your presentation. You also save time in the long run, plus you'll be sure to, that your presentation covers everything you need to cover for your idea or data to be understood. Your planning uh, stage should account for visuals that'll help back up your story. This can include photos, icons, charts, infographic elements, tables, and anything else you need to make your data more visually appealing. Once you've decided on the visuals you want, gather them all in one place so you can easily locate them. Finally, decide what's the next step your audience should take once you're done delivering your presentation. Make sure your last slide includes your call to action along with specific instructions on what to do. So we definitely get questions on like what structure to use. And the answer is anything as long as it's convincing, memorable, and scalable. Um, so here are just some I mean, I feel like there's so many um, uh, sort of strategies and structural choices that you can do. These are just a, a handful. Um, the idea is that it's simple. Uh, another thing to note is that people's attention spans are very small. So keeping one topic per slide is preferable. And uh, just to illustrate the idea of scalability, here's a potential outline we created for a hypothetical presentation. We also know that like, we've been given 45 minutes for our presentation, but what if we're given 30? We're losing some detail here, or only 15. The basic format stays the same. We only lose some supporting details or information, but the bookends stay the same. Uh, the next uh, section of slides covers some cognitive load principles. Uh, this, um, with some of the material the university library focused on quite a bit. And I found it to be pretty interesting. I learned a lot from this actually. 
uh, specifically about um, what what the actual terms are for some of these um, sort of principles. So the first one is weeding. Um, and this is definitely one of my favorites. Uh, we use it a lot in our print material, but the idea is, the idea is to <clears throat> um, take all this information and eliminate the interesting but extraneous material so that people can focus on what's important. Distractions can be an opportunity for attention to wander. Same idea can be applied to photos. Here we have a photo centered on a slide, but we also still see the border with um, the current slide number and like where we are and some logos. Whereas increasing the size of the photos um, so that it bleeds off the edge creates an area of focus. We have a principle of alignment. This puts corresponding words and images near each other so people don't have to scan all over the slide to make connections. So here we just have um, a pretty heavy body of text, but it's, um, it's very usable information, but we might want to, to change it to something like this. And, and then we might, as the speakers say, between 2018 and 2019, 5,392 graduate students and postdocs attended Rack and Professional and Academic Development Program events. The idea here is to put up is put up the words spoken or written at the same time as the corresponding images or animations, rather than have all the text first, then all the images second. Similar to the idea of aligning, people need to hear and see the words simultaneously with the images or animations. Uh, people read faster than you think. Uh, so this is the idea of redundancy images, narration and on-screen text, all at the same time is too much for people to absorb. So show pictures while you talk or give them text to read. And this uh, might give you an opportunity to take a, a quick breather, uh, maybe a drink of water, or just let them read the information by themselves. Principle of segmenting. People need time to pass the information from short-term to long-term memory, allow pauses, and in providing multimedia examples, be sure that you or the student can pause it as needed. So again, um, I'm a big fan of breaking ideas apart. That keeps the audience focused and it feels a little bit more conversational. Uh, here we have a slide of, uh, with a lot of copy. I mean, maybe it's not too much copy, but there's a lot of really like great information here. So maybe we can think about breaking it apart. And so here we have career exploration offering, offerings including include the designing your life mini course, what's next workshops and the PhD connections conference. Internship support includes the Rackham uh, spring summer internship grants for bioscience doctoral students and the Rackham public engagement fellowships. And Rackham Connect developed in partnership with the Career Services University Career Center Alumni Network to allow students to connect with alumni and potential mentors. And then the principle of signaling provides cues to help people focus on the most important information without their having to figure out what is important. So here we have a pretty standard graph. Um, uh, we're not maybe not quite sure what to focus on. I'm gonna be, you know, I might be talking about some food, food intake, some, some calories obviously here. Uh, this is definitely not an accurate uh, graph, but the important thing here is to think about this graph, but if I'm, if I'm trying to focus on something, let them know what you're actually trying to focus on. So this is definitely something where maybe at a glance you can, you can, um, see what uh, the actual focus is. So there's no question that we aren't supposed to focus on the Coney dog outcome here of the lowest calorie counts, which I'm not sure is true, but for this uh, case, we'll, we'll go with it. So once you've planned your presentation, 
uh, it's time to tackle the design part of creating the presentation. Um, so we'll just keep some of these guidelines in mind. Uh, color can make your presentation more appealing, but that doesn't mean uh, you got to color every slide differently or use uh, color different colors for your fonts. If you're presenting in a dark room, consider using a dark background for the slide paired with a light color text. It'll make for easier. It'll make it easier for your audience to follow along, and having a consistent color scheme throughout your presentation. So on on the right here, uh, I illustrated sort of the color palette for this particular presentation. Uh, the three primary colors being the maize white, and then the actual white outline is the blue, uh, UM blue background. And the two thin stripes are just my highlight colors. So those are just used really sparingly throughout, call to, uh, call to attention, um, great for highlighting objects. I think we remember the, the green from the Coney dog um, graph. Uh, we always love this contrast text colors with background um, color. Uh, contrast is definitely key to legibility here. Um, I love using our Arboretum Blue on the right, but I definitely can't use it for uh, text on our UM Blue background. Um, there are a lot of neat uh, color checkers out there. Um, they're, they're pretty easy to spot online. Um, that's something we can definitely follow up with later. But um, when in doubt, I would stay, uh, stay to uh, high contrast uh, colors. Negative space, something that um, is always fun for <laughs> but a lot of graphic designers talk about this all the time because we tend to like a lot of white space in our work, but um, it's a good thing. And again, I think this uh, is a good example of calling attention to an object. Again, it's just a square here, uh, but there's no uh, distraction and um, it allows for a lot of easy focus. Um, this is again, back to one of our principles, but limiting uh, the text to five to six words per line, three to four bullet, bullets per slide, using concise wording and elaborate as you speak. Again, depending on your content, you may want a different slide for each main point. Another thing to keep in mind is uh, not every audience will be close to the slides or uh, possibly for an access accessibility purposes. So. When in doubt, make sure to use uh, larger font sizes. Uh, I try to stick to 24 points or larger, uh, but what's really helpful within the dropdown menu of, of uh, PowerPoints or Google Slides or Keynotes is just to try and stick with the point size suggestions that are in the dropdown menu. So um, we all know 12 points is definitely a drop, a drop down. Um, recommendation, but, um, you know, like 25.5, I mean, I, I, I don't see like, sometimes we might use that um, just if we're trying to make room or make something a little bit bigger, but uh, try to stay stick within those recommendations and it'll also help with your hierarchy of type. Um, you know, knowing that a title should always be, you know, a large size 48, 54 um, subtitle could be like, 30 point and then your body copy would be 24. Um, I did add the 14 point uh, because sometimes uh, like in the top section there, uh, it's information uh, that's sort of secondary. So the page numbers at the bottom are 14 point. Um, I could see possibly a bibliography having some uh, typefaces like that. Um, but again, those could also be uh, much bigger. I think um, kind of go bigger, go home. I think it's really, it's, it's just better to stay on the larger side. Um, use fonts that are easy to read, avoid uh, script fonts, unless they're used very sparingly. I mean, we use script fonts a lot in our print work for uh, development. We might say, you know, congratulations, something that's very big, but maybe one word. I think that's uh, totally fine. Um, and uh, steer clear of all caps. I think it's fine um, when you're maybe doing a section title or, and again, um, you know, very small um, amounts of text, definitely not in sentences. Uh, all caps makes text hard to read. Uh, it conceals acronyms. 
um, and also denies uh, their use for emphasis. So, you know, if you wanted to write all caps and all caps, you could do that if you were trying to emphasize it. Um, and as far as fonts are concerned, um, we always have recommendations. So if you're ever just wondering like what fonts might be the best font for uh, a presentation, um, we've definitely done a lot of uh, research on like what the most accessible typeface is. A lot of fonts that come with your computer actually are uh, fairly accessible, uh, though some are better than others. So um, yeah, if you have any questions about that, um, we'd be happy to answer it. Uh, this particular um, typeface that I've used globally on this presentation is called Open Sans, and it's a it's a free Google typeface. Um, it's it's really wonderful. Uh, Lucida Grand or Lucida Sans uh, that come with your computer are also really helpful. Uh, another a great accessible typeface. You know that works with like dyslexia, and it's just really wonderful all around. Uh, Staying on text here, you know, being consistent with your use of headline. Uh, we have two sort of examples. We have the title, um, our headline capitalization, and the sentence capitalization. Uh, one thing uh, I always have to kind of be mindful of also in presentation is uh, do I put periods at the end of my bullets or do I not? And just trying to be consistent with that too. Um, I'd say uh, centering text is okay, and I'll talk more about that in the next slide, but um, one thing to do is try not to uh, use bullet points when uh, centering text. It becomes really uh, hard to read, um, and in general, um, I would steer clear of centering text in general. Um, I think it's fine for maybe title slides and, and things like that, but um, we're so used to reading um, text that's left uh, aligned that, uh, again, for accessibility purposes, um, my recommendation is going to be uh, using left, left align. Also, um, you can see in the bottom example that it has sort of like the rag on the right hand side, which just means it kind of moves back and forth, whereas justified is uh, where it's um, aligned on both sides. Um, having the rag on the right also is, is easier for uh, someone to read. So again, uh, centering text is, is, you know, I think fine for like a pull quote or a title slide, but um, I'm a lot more and more in my work, I'm tending to um, choose left align. It's, it's easier for, for anyone to read and um, it just decreases that cognitive load. Um, when at all possible, use the text boxes that come with the layouts. Um, the primary slide controls these, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when I go over um, PowerPoint templates. Um, and again, here we can see the, the title is sort of bold and it's big, subtitle and body copy. So we have this nice hierarchy. Um, they're very obvious um, in the different sizes. And this is also great for scannability and accessibility as far as um, being able to read a document, again, without um, confusion. <laughs> yeah, so media should have a purpose. Uh, you know, don't, don't, put, don't put anything on there if it's not helping you make your point. Um, here we see this sort of like <laughs> screened out uh, maybe a Maserati or something, but it's it it it, it sort of aligns with the uh, uh, not so far, um, with with the text here, but it 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 kind of detracts from the slide. Um, we want to balance text and graphics. Um, paying attention to placement of the imagery and the text. Here again, we have like quite a quite a big overload and. Uh, I'm just using these examples. I don't think I don't expect <laughs> I've never I don't expect uh, anybody to be doing anything like this, but I definitely want to use some of these as uh, an illustration on uh, sort of like maybe what not to do. Um, 
again here thinking about uh, the balance of imagery, you know, what we might do is take out that what is IoT, make that a nice title, Internet of Things is a small body copy and maybe picking one um, photograph to work with. Uh, there is limited uh, image editing within PowerPoint, Google Slides, Keynote. Um, we can do a few things with actually within um, PowerPoint itself. So on the top left, we have the original image. Um, on the right hand side, we just have we've blown it up and we've we've actually the photograph goes off the edge and then we can also um, create some borders or masking. Uh, there are a few effects that actually come with PowerPoint. Um, I don't recommend uh, using them unless um, they actually add to it. So there's there's drop shadows and, and all sorts of animations. Um, I can certainly see cases for using any effect. I, I just wouldn't recommend as is, um, it's usually extraneous material that um, I, I don't know uh, adds anything more to a presentation. So I, yeah, I'd steer clear of using uh, too many effects. Uh, when using charts, make sure it's legible and display the data necessary to make your point and no more. So here's a good idea of less is more. This is an actual slide from the Pentagon, uh, helping, maybe helping to describe the complexity of the Afghan conflict. Uh, I was like, it, I, you know, is this like a poster? And it's not, it's an actual uh, <laughs> PowerPoint slide. So I, again, I, I don't see anybody doing this. I just thought these were very <laughs> interesting examples. Um, this is a, a big one for me uh, because I'm always struggling to find high resolution images just with anything I do. Um, and there's there's ways of finding out the resolution and we can, we can cover that later at another time, but um, uh, basically try to find uh, high resolution images for your presentations. Um, they can be pulled from the web. Uh, Google does have a tool where you can actually search um, for the size of the uh, image. Um, and images pulled from social media are also not ideal as they're already compressed. So, you know, sometimes I've been tempted to pull uh, uh, maybe a, a you know, we have a speaker and I'm tempted to pull with something, they're like their headshot off Facebook. And the hard part about it is that it's already been compressed. So I could, I could use it as a, at a very small scale, but um, yeah, using it for print is, would probably be out, be out of the question. And um, so yeah, I would steer clear of that. So here we have like a, an example of what, what could be a, a pretty interesting uh, infograph, though maybe a lot to look at. Um, we can see that it's it's definitely fuzzy, and we um, this is just pulled straight off of Google. Um, so at this point, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Mark, um, who's going to talk about accessibility and, and a few other ideas. And then after that, uh, we're going to uh, take a quick look at a PowerPoint template. Thanks. Actually. Um, were you going to keep the slides up? I, I can. Okay, so um, everything covered so far are accessibility best practices. So why have a, a specific section on accessibility? So what I'm going to cover today uh, concerning accessibility is what happens to your PowerPoint or Google Slides once you um, want to share them with your attendees, for example. So we need to make sure that those files that we're sharing are also accessible. <clears throat> How we make the presentations accessible depends on the software used. So if it's Google Slides or PowerPoint, there are different methods a lot of the same procedures, but they're done differently because they're different products. Uh, today will just be a quick overview, but in the future we'll have another Comm Lab where we actually uh, do a deep dive 
into making uh, documents of all kinds accessible. And uh, we'll make everything we cover today um, available following the presentation. So for formatting, uh, the, first, the first thing we want to think about is how the document is formatted. Um, so someone who can see will usually read a slide top to bottom and left to right or right to left, depending on the language. But someone using a screen reader reads the items in the slide in the order they were added. So um, we need to ensure that the, the reading order of the slide uh, makes sense to a screen reader. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, let's see. Um, we like to ensure the links in the slides have meaningful link text and that tables are used only for data and the tables are presented simply with a clear header row. And then we check to ensure that color alone is not used to convey information. So let's say that you have one word out of a paragraph or, or out of a sentence or a bullet point that's highlighted in red. Uh, someone who is colorblind may not see a difference with the, the main color of the text and the red text. It may look all gray to them. Uh, so we need to ensure that there's another um, another uh, format uh, change made. So maybe that text is bolder, or maybe that single word is completely capitalized. Um, not well. It could be underlined, but we generally reserve underline for hyperlinks. Uh, but if if the document isn't going to be um, if it's not clickable, then uh, that's less of a concern. But uh, underlines are, are usually uh, reserved for hyperlinks. Um, so next slide. So alternative text for visuals. So that includes uh, photographs, that includes charts, graphs, and what have you. So alternative texts help people who can't see the screen understand what's important in the images. And uh, writing good alt text, it's, it's more than saying this is a chart. Uh, if it's a, a chart or graph, it must be described uh, in a in a equivalent way, so uh, all of the data needs to be described narratively, uh, so that it makes sense when being read. Um, also, avoid using text in images as much as possible. Um, if it's the only way that uh, you can do that, make sure that the text is repeated in the alt text or that it's repeated in the body of the slide. And then also briefly describe in the image alt text that uh, it's mentioned somewhere within the slide. Um, and again, all of this will be um, explored um, in depth in a, in a future Com Lab. Uh, next slide. So finally, for presentation sharing, um, oh, actually, this was for the previous slide, but that's okay. Um, also, make sure that your videos are accessible to visually impaired and hearing impaired users. At the moment, we are focused on visually impaired, so we make sure everything is closed captioned. Um, but in the future, we will need to also be mindful of adding descriptive text, which is another form of caption, uh, not captioning, but it's a voiceover where someone uh, describes any action that's happening, describes what they're seeing in the presentation, but that's a long ways away. No, um, no one at the university has figured out how to do this um, quickly and, and inexpensively. So it's not a concern right now, but it, it is something we need to, to think about in the future. Uh, so for presentation sharing, uh, when sharing your presentation, consider keeping your speaker's notes as part of the document, especially um, uh, using the design principles Jameson went over, where we're taking um, information out of the slide and presenting it uh, ourselves and, and saying the things that we want to say. 
So uh, you can use the speaker's notes a, as a way to fill in that information that's no longer on the slide. Um, and then uh, share your presentation as a PDF. Uh, it's a ubiquitous uh, format and it's very easy to make them accessible. Um, as long as the, the source document is accessible, then the PDF, it, it kind of goes, goes along. But there's, um, there's a pr procedure that we go through for both PDF and, and um, slide decks. Uh, and then, of course, these are good skills for everyone to know, and we'll cover everything in the future. But send your presentation to uh, communications for a review. We're happy to do it. And um, it's usually a fairly quick process. Um, so the next slide. And now uh, we're going to talk a bit about interactivity. Um, and if you go to the next slide. So what products are available for interactivity? So the only thing that Rackham uh, currently offers that's supported is Poll Everywhere. And um, Poll Everywhere allows you to add interactive elements to your presentations. So multiple choice questions, word clouds, um, all kinds of kind of voting and, and game show kind of features. And this is available to everyone. There is a cost to it, and we do have to get approval um, through budget and accounts, but it's available to anyone who's doing presentations and Zoom, um, Zoom meetings and anyone who, who does virtual events. Um, so some of the things that you can use Poll Everywhere for is to visualize staff feedback during meetings, measure engagement, uh, follow up on feedback. Uh, you can also use it to take attendance, uh, give quizzes, engage understanding during presentations. Uh, it works with PowerPoint, Apple Keynote, Google Slides, and uh, they can be added just about everywhere in just a few clicks. It really is a, a very easy product to work with. Um, and just uh, contact uh, Rackham Communications and we can, we can get the approval process uh, started and, and do the training and, and all that stuff. Uh, and if you go to the next slide. So um, that's the only product we currently support. Um, so there are a lot of products. Uh, I know we've seen products like idea boards and things like that. Um, but even though they're free and it's tempting to use them, we need to ensure that the tools in our toolbox are accessible, secure, and sustainable for our use. And I'll go through what that means. Um, so products must pass accessibility requirements. We begin that process by looking for an accessibility statement from the vendor or what's called a Voluntary Product Availability Template, also called a VPAT, V-P-A-T. Um, those are really uh, important documents uh, when we're evaluating the accessibility of a product. Uh, if a vendor doesn't have at least an accessibility statement, then we pretty much know that that's not something they focus on. So, um, um, uh, Poll Everywhere has both an accessibility statement and VPATs for both presenters and for attendees of events. Um, we have never um, had it evaluated by an actual tester, an actual human tester. We've trusted that they, they do what they say they do. And that, that's one of the limiting factors is there's only so much we can do. Um, with the resources we have, so we trust what they say. Um, if a product involves sensitive data and poll everywhere might, um, not, not on by our choice, but you might ask a question that might be a bit sensitive and, and receive a, an answer that has sensitive data in it. Um, so we ask for at the very least compliance with industrial industry security standards 
as well as um, uh, depending on the situation, we may ask the vendor to sign a data protection agreement. And then finally, we consider the sustainability of a product. We need to ensure that our investment uh, of time and staff resources is sound. Has the company been around for a while? Is the product well documented? Is training available? Does it have a robust user community? And is it priced affordably? So we, um, you, some of you may remember that we had an interactive product called Mentimeter. And it was a great product, but it was also, um, it ended up for a, a yearly single user account, um, well over $1,000 a year. So that, that made it, that put it out of reach for um, rolling it out widely for staff where Poll Everywhere is priced a little better and uh, we can actually turn it on and off um, monthly uh, with no, um, no negative effects. So if, if someone needs the product for a few months uh, to do a, a workshop series, then, then it's available. Um, and then after all of this, we have to make a proposal and present it to Rackham's management team for approval. And um, it's time consuming and why can't we just do it? But, but it's very important that we do this to ensure all of, the, all of our core beliefs uh, for DEI, for example, and security are, are followed. Uh, next slide. And for your enjoyment, we've prepared a brief poll everywhere multiple choice quiz for you all. So if you go to the next slide, um, there you go. So um, you can go to pollev.com slash rackamg729, and that will open up the, um, the poll everywhere interface to answer the question. It says, um, at least my screen shows, to receive credit for response, well, register for credit. I wonder why. Hmm. It says, to receive credit for responses given to Rackham 729, you must register with the presenter. Click register below. That's interesting. So it's asking me to, I need an account before you can register with Rackham Graduate School. Hmm. Oh, then you just added your name. Hmm. Mark, is the interface different on the mobile versus joining on your computer? It, it will ask for a, like a first name. You could just put in an initial. Mm -hmm. And that is how um, it keeps track of who is answering. I'm, I'm having similar issues as as Emma. Hmm. Yeah, because let's see. I just selected sign in. It said sign in here or sign in with Google. So I selected sign in with Google and I chose my U of M email that popped up. And yeah, and it's very odd because you shouldn't need to sign in with Google at all. Hmm. It says, it says pull ev.com slash username. Hmm. Yeah, I typed in my Al Maureen username. I hit dismiss and didn't require me to log in with anything. So it created oh. a guest account. Uh, oh. Yeah. Oh. 
Let's see. That's that's odd. You're entering. Hmm. Uh, or maybe it's. It should just be that link that I shared in chat. And what it should take you to is just the question. That's very odd. Oh, uh, okay. I got it to work. Oh, I see. Uh, skip for now. When it asks for credit, just skip for now because you're you're not you don't need credit. <laughs> So I think everyone's responded to that slide. We can go to the next one. Oh, and um, the the uh, five hundred million was the correct answer. Hmm. And in your pull everywhere, well, this was a fun experiment. It doesn't look like it's working quite right because the uh, the question should have changed in the web browser while we were doing this. So it is not working. I apologize. Uh, try switching to the next slide, Jameson. Yeah, the interface isn't changing. So I apologize for this. Let us just skip to Zoom. But thank you for playing. Um, so of course, you probably all heard about Zoom. Um, so this is just going to be a, a quick, um, a quick um, kind of, uh, list of helpers. So uh, if you go to the next slide. So for accessibility, the Center for Academic, uh, Academic Innovation created a, a really amazing checklist uh, that covers every phase of the Zoom session. And it, it really does, it covers everything you need to think about to ensure that your Zoom session is accessible. Um, many of you may have already seen it, um, it's listed as a resource in the Rackham Remote Programming Toolbox, which is also a, a comprehensive document on, on uh, doing uh, virtual events. Um, we'll also include links uh, in the resources. Uh, one thing on accessibility to take back to your teams is when mentioning live captioning, or live transcription, please indicate that if it's an automated transcription or it's if it's a human transcriptionist, uh, it, it, it really is a, a different experience and the expectations will be different for the, the two different kinds of, of uh, captioning. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Hey, so Mark, can for, I ask a question about sure. that? Is, um, is it appropriate? Like, how do you how do you say that? Do you like you say enable? You know, you can enable auto transcriptions or cart services provided by a human. Is that the way to say it, or is cart services always provided by a human? I'm just wondering, like the the most appropriate way to actually say it. Right. So, if if you have an event where no accommodation has been requested, but your saying that if someone wants to turn on um, captioning, make sure that they know that it's automated captioning. So it's mainly when, when you're talking about that. I, I've, uh, during some presentations, the, the presenter will often say that they can turn on, that uh, attendees can turn on captioning. 
Just say that it's automated captioning though. Okay, got it, thanks. Yep. Um, so recording, um, if you plan on recording, uh, please remember to announce your intentions uh, well ahead of time, well, well before the session happens. Uh, so if there's any concerns about that, the attendees can, can contact you and discuss it. Um, I don't see this as, as anything anyone in, at Rackham in particular does, so don't worry about that. It's, it's mainly that, um, that it's just really important to do is to get cons consent. Um, and then on the next slide, um, if you present frequently, you may want to consider upgrading your equipment. Uh, the remote programming toolbox includes lists of various cameras, microphones, and other items to use for your Zoom event. Um, we even list a, a folding green screen that fits over the back of your office chair uh, in case you, you want to really get fancy and, and um, be like um, a special effects wizard. Um, so uh, all of those things are available. Uh, you need to request it, of course, uh, through uh, Rackham ITS and get it, get it approved. But if you're doing a lot of this kind of work, um, especially as a presenter, you definitely want to ensure that your, your equipment um, is of a high standard to ensure good audio and good video. And... Um, then uh, if you switch to the next slide, we'll be in our resources section. So of course, uh, a great resource for presentations is our new brand site. And there you'll find uh, information on our colors, typography, and more. Um, and there it is, the brand site and the colors. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, there is a cost for equipment, but um, we have had people that have been able to, I mean, if you do, if you do a few Zoom presentations a week, or even one a week, um, then that has been considered justifiable, a justifiable cost. So, and that, that has been loosening up a little um, as time goes on but um, it, it does need to be approved. Um, let's see, so um, data. Uh, sometimes when we have acquired a lot of data, we're not quite sure where to go next. Uh, Storytelling with data is a great site for understanding how to visualize data. And then LinkedIn Learning is a great and free resource to all U of M um, faculty, staff, and students. Uh, the course range, courses range from software to soft skills, and there are also badges you can earn for your profile. And also when you complete some of them, uh, you'll also um, receive um, a notice in your LinkedIn profile that you've completed it. Uh, so uh, Unsplash, uh, so I have, to, I have to say that Jameson wrote this, but it's also one of my favorites. Um, and one we use a fair amount in communications. Unsplash is a, a free stock photo site with photos that are professionally taken and curated. And it doesn't have uh, everything, but it's definitely one of the best in Jameson's opinion and mine. <laughs> Yeah, bookmark, bookmark that one for sure. That's such a wonderful resource. And I think that is about it. And now Jameson will demo the template. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Mark. And uh, just going back into the equipment, um, I mean, I use a, a ring light and I have another light up here and another light up here. I mean, I have a, a nice big window, but I'm just, I'm just not near it. So um pre um like when i first started uh like a year ago my my video would have been 
kind of like this, but now I've I've upgraded since then. And uh, those ring lights are they're pretty inexpensive. I think I got mine on eBay for twenty bucks or so. Um, so I just I know we're running out of time, but I definitely wanted to um, share with you um, a present uh, our um, one of our new templates. Um, so this is a PowerPoint, which is a little different than Google Slides, but they're very similar products. And you can actually import and export between the two, which is really cool. Um, but I wanted to kind of run through some uh, new features. Um, again, just like with ComLab, we're, we're piloting, um, piloting things. So um, this slide template uh, is pretty robust. It has a lot of um, new options uh, different types of data sets, section headers, um, photo opportunities, full bleed. Um, we'll also have a small bank of, of images for you to use when you say, hey, I want a picture of a student, I need a picture of campus. I'll have that. Uh, there's a stats area, quotes. Um, but again, like, um, just like with ComLab, you know, the feedback is going to be super important with this. Um, I, I tend to give, I tend to create like lots of options, but I won't create an option for every single need. So it'll be important to, for us to hear uh, what your needs are uh, when it comes to presentations. Um, this uh, presentation right here is actually just something I set up, but there are so many um, actual slide options within the document. Uh, so if you wanted to quickly add uh, a new photo, um, you can click the icon here and you could add um, an image and a uh, new title. And it does give you some other options here. Um, those are also within the template. I, Personally, I tend to stick with uh, my intuition, but those might be helpful to some. Um, so this is um, sort of a newer way of working uh, with the PowerPoint template uh, presentations. I know in the past, we've given uh, just a handful of slides here. There's gonna be quite a few more options. Um, a few things will also be embedded into it. And, uh, and I'd be happy to go over uh, this with anyone, um, you know, if you wanted, if you need to do like a one-on-one, -on -one, if you just need like a real high level under uh, understanding of like how to leverage the new um, templates, but there are themes in, uh, also in here where you can change the colors. Um, these are all uh, UM brand colors. Uh, again, thinking about um, accessibility really for this slide, we, we really can only use maize or, um, or white. But a good example be here, we have, um, if we wanted to emphasize these numbers, we might uh, change them to maze. Um, another thing that's pretty fun, I mean, I added some GIFs or GIFs to the other presentations, videos. Uh, those are also uh, sections in there. Um, there are some sort of contact slides at the end. And again, there will be, um, some blank slides as well. Like if you feel like um, you kind of want to just go at it um, like we have been, that's, that's totally fine, but there are also uh, some other options. One uh, thing that I think is uh, very important for uh, all of the slides here are is the grid. So we can see that there's a grid um, on each slide now, and this is just something you can turn off and turn on. I keep it on because it helps me uh, move text around um, a good thing to know is that maybe if you have a photograph on here and all of your content is in the bottom left, we could, you know, you can move this around, but you see how I just want to, I want to keep things kind of like on that grid. Um, so when in doubt, um, just kind of make sure things are, stay on that grid. And, um, that in general will give, will give an overall, uh, cohesive look to your presentation. So there's no guesswork on where to maybe put an object. And um, just like any presentation, there's some flexibility. And these 
just like it says, these are just guides. They aren't, they aren't necessarily rules. These are just recommendations. Um, so I definitely just wanted to cover that really quickly. Um, and at this point, I know we're um, basically out of time. So um, I just wanted to know if anybody had any specific questions at this time. I know, um, again, we're gonna be sending out uh, a feedback form. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I know in, in doing this process, I one definitely learned a lot about presentations and um, you know, I, we, I know we want to um, hear about uh, topics that you'd like to um, learn about um, and uh, any other feedback you have in general. So if you have any questions. Um, Joe is asking where um, we can download the template. So we will be able, uh, we will be sending out um, the template soon. I'm, that might be uh, in an email or uh, possibly in um, Monday's um, staff newsletter. Uh, and I think in the future, um, we, will, we will keep um, material on our site um, when we're, we're, we're hoping to have some other templates that will uh, align itself with uh, the new brand. Um, the presentation templates, um, since so many people are working uh, digitally right now, uh, we felt like um, it's just like a low hanging fruit, and especially when we were coming out with ComLab, that uh, to be able to offer this at the same time. I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to thank you so much. This was a lot of great information. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Uh, I was going to say uh, to both of you, it reminds me of the old days when uh, you used to be able to go in downstairs to have the comm labs and uh, learn some some cool information. So this is awesome. Thanks, guys. Oh, that's 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 so good to hear. I know we're I know we're pretty excited about it. <laughs> Thank you. So if that's all, uh, yeah, so we'll be sending out um, a feedback form and um, and please let us know if you have any questions and I'm sure um, I'm sure we'll be following up with everyone shortly. So I hope everyone has a good day. We'll see you soon. <laughs>